And yeah, we can get started. Um, my name is Kelsey. I'm the class coordinator at the Sugar Beet. We have Lissa, our marketing manager at the Sugar Beet as well with us. Um, Jen Lopez is our presenter for the evening with this really amazing slideshow we're about to see. Jen came to work in cheese after studying painting and material studies. The further she journeyed into the history and world of cheese, the more she realized that art and cheese were one and the same. 16 years later, her work keeps her traveling the US and abroad, promoting artisan cheeses imported from Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Croatia. She is a certified cheese professional and inducted into the Guild de Fromage. Did I say that right? Yep. Excellent. So yeah, I will hand it over to you, Jen. Great. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to do this. Um, since the pandemic, I don't have as much opportunity to talk about cheese um, with people in person, or, you know, just, I'm always emailing. Um, and so this is a real treat for me. And um, we did this last year and I, I'm very excited and flattered that we're doing it again. Um, and here on this slide is my contact information. So if you have any questions or want to reach me after this presentation, please do, because I welcome fun questions uh, that are take me away from my work duties and responsibilities. Um, so just a little bit of background uh, as far as uh, who I am and what I do um, is I work for a company called Forever Cheese and we import um, cheeses from Spain, Italy, Portugal, and Croatia. And that is mainly what we do is we are a cheese house and we, our goal is really to um, have the cheese be in, you know, for you to have the same experience eating the cheese here as you would if you were eating it in the countries of origin. Um, we import anywhere um, from 100 to 120 different cheeses um, from these regions, uh, depending on the season. And we also import everything that goes with cheese. So we import jamon and prosciutto and nuts and jams and mustardas and it just goes on and on, but everything to really support um, your experience uh, eating cheese. Uh, and this uh, is Sonia, uh, which is one of our producers of, or the producer that we work with uh, for San Simon, which is a smoked cow's milk cheese. And these are the cheese, the cheese is actually a cone shape. And so these are the molds that the cheeses are formed in. Uh, we can stop, you can, we can talk about, I mean, we're, the topic is cheese boards, but really, you know, we can talk about, we can talk about the Supreme Court if you want to talk about that. I have a lot to say about that too. Um, so importing is what we do. Um, and we work with producers that, you know, have really have the highest safety standards and who prioritize uh, animal wear welfare. Um, the pandemic really has strengthened these relationships and created an even stronger bond um, with all of our producers. Uh, you know, they were, many of them had, uh, you know, devastating, um, con you know, consequences, some of them, you know, personally and their families, but, you know, every day they were making cheese. None of our producers ever stopped making cheese. They made it daily. Um, and, um, it was really through their determination that, you know, a lot of us, uh, felt like we could get out of bed, um, during this, this terrible time. So this is just a photo of our producers in Italy, um, which we gather, um, our producers together, um, 
on a regular basis uh, to really all um, get on the same page, talk about uh, new new things that are um, happening, you know, with regulations and all of that. But it's always good to to get together and see everybody. So there's a lot of people that we're coordinating um, with in all of these different places. Um, this is something I put together too because I wanted to sort of. This is just for uh, one of the cheeses you're going to be eating tonight. This is this is the journey that it's made. So it's gone from a tiny island, um, one of the islands in the Canary Islands, and it actually goes to Madrid um, first, where uh, the cheese is consolidated with other cheeses and put into carefully into a container and then travels from um, there to a port and then to um, to a port in New Jersey, where then it gets trucked to a distributor in Chicago, where it then gets to you. And this is just the journey of one of our cheeses. Um, and this is a long, you know, a long journey, which might, uh, you know, you might think, why would I want to support, you know, uh, a cheese that comes this far and has this large of a carbon footprint? But since 2007, we worked with a carbon fund to offset um, this, um, the, the travel. Um, and also, it's one of the one of the re these are also reasons you should be want to buy imported cheese is there's hundred the history and the uh, tradition is sometimes hundreds or thousands of years old. The quality is undeniable um, and the value is actually still in the climate that we're in now where prices are rising. Every single day, um, it still is very competitive pricing compared to um, domestic cheeses. And if y'all have any questions about uh, what's happening uh, as far as the supply chain or um, containers or the lack of them, um, I, I'm happy to answer all those questions. And this is just another, we can also talk about mold or how to store cheese, shelf lives, lactose, anything like that. Um, questions that you might have, I should probably be able to answer them. This is a, a great picture of the surface mold um, that is developing the rind on a cheese from Catalonia called Garrocha. So let's talk about our topic, uh, which is cheese boards. So cheese boards have become like incredibly popular um, and it's exciting because it's really become an entry, entry way for people that maybe wouldn't have necessarily been interested in cheese, but the composition and the artistry that's happening in cheese boards and they're all over the internet, um, has really gotten people excited about um, uh, exploring cheese and having cheese as a big part of um, entertaining. So um, what I, this is how I start. And when I'm working with people or in the past when I've worked with people um, and they're trying to put a cheese plate together the first thing that you, first question, there's two big questions that you should ask yourself um, before you start um, throwing things into your basket. And the first one is how many people are going to be there? I mean, obviously, if you buy more cheese than you need, you can certainly eat it, you know, uh, the next day or through the next week. But it's important to sort of really strategically plan, like I'm, I'm having this many people and a serving of cheese is really only one ounce, which I know sounds sad because I, I know I probably ate three ounces of cheese before we even got on this thing. But 
a serving of cheese is only one ounce. And so really it doesn't, you don't need to buy pounds and pounds of cheese unless there's yet a lot of people coming. So you need to figure out how many people um, you're dealing with and determine, you know, a rough uh, estimate of how much cheese you're going to need. Uh, so once you've determined, wait, let's go back. I think I missed one. Okay. Um, did I skip two? No. Okay. Uh, will there be other food? So if you're just doing beverages and cheese and a cheese board, um, you probably will want to purchase more cheese and um, have some other uh, supporting actors. Um, but if you're serving other food, I wouldn't go overboard because people are likely to really uh, feel satiated and full. Um, if you're serving this as uh, at the beginning of your meal. So it's good to um, think about what other food is going to be served um, the rest of the evening. Let's see. So once we, um, so once you've determined how many people and how much cheese you're going to need, then comes the uh, part where we get to start our selection process, which is um, the fun part. So things to consider when building a cheese board is um, you want to have some variety. So one of the things you wanna consider is texture. So you might wanna have one thing that's soft and creamy, which would be like a brie, something firm and savory or nutty, which would be like manchego is very, has very savory and is firm. And then something harder potentially um, and crunchy, like with tarosine um, crystallization in it. That would, um, those, if you have, if you fill those gaps, then you're going to have, you know, this variety of textures and flavors too. And the next thing you want to, you can explore are different milk types. So what I often do, and that's what we considered when we were making the choices for this evening is to have something that's cow, something that's sheep, something that's goat, or something buffalo. You, you guys don't have any buffalo cheese, but when you're doing this in the future, if you also, in addition to the textures, think about, well, this one's cow, this one's soft and it's cows, and this one's firm and it's sheep, and this other one is firm and it's goat, just by doing those things, you're gonna accomplish having variety and with the different species of milks, that also gives you different taste profiles because each, um, each species has different uh, qualities just inherently, and that's not even taking into consideration the make of the cheese or the age of the cheese that also just compounds everything. is so weird. So the other thing that you can consider um, would be, so maybe let's go back um, to this a little bit. So when we think about what you guys have on your plate, um, so we did, was it an either or thing or did y'all put fromage uh, for and, and the alamar? Kelsey. They got both of them, Jen. They got both. Okay. So the both, so the Alamar cow's milk, the blue earth and the fromage chauffinois, that would fill the creamy cow's milk. And then um, you have 
Dalmati nuts and Campo. Those are both firmer cheeses and both of these are also mixed milk cheeses. So um, that's actually another category that I didn't even mention, which is mi mixed milk cheeses, which um, even just the uh, just by mixing different milks together, you get um, a lot of complexity of flavor. So even very young cheeses like roviolas that are mixed milk are really uh, full bodied and 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 really tasty. Um, you have a smoked cheese. Um, which is a, a, it's a slightly firm cheese. It's actually only aged 15 days though, shockingly, um, the smoke and goat. And then also a blue cheese, um, which is ba your Bailey Hazen. Um, and then we had a sheep smoke cheese, um, which is the woolly woolly, which is a fresh sheep milk, which we're going to do something with if you haven't already. So those are, um, those cheeses were selected based on basically filling them into those slots of creamy, firm, and also giving a variety of milks. Um, also on this, there's these other categories like, um, you can explore the categories. So something soft ripened would be like a wash rind red hawk. Um, then something fresh like the woolly woolly that you guys are able to eat tonight. Something aged, which would be something like an aged Gouda or aged Manchego. Um, something flavored, which is this laden which um, they sell at Sugar Beet, which when I first started selling cheese, this cheese did not sound appealing to me at all. And it's actually quite delicious. It's like a Gouda style cheese that has cumin in it. If you guys haven't tried that already. And then Humboldt Fog. So all of these are different categories and if you picked out something from each of these categories, it would be a pretty exciting cheese plate. And the other thing is too, is I would um, actually, all the cheeses that you guys have tonight is a lot of different cheeses. I tend to keep things scaled back a little bit. And when I'm just, um, and because it just, when you have so many different things, it, uh, things can, you know, get a little complicated or if you're trying to pair things. So you're actually trying a lot of different things tonight, which is kind of cool. Um, I don't know why it skips ahead. So there also could be a theme and this is something to consider too, also at the beginning. So like if you guys are serving a spaghetti supper, then you could focus on Italian cheeses. If you're doing like for Thanksgiving, you could, since it's an, um, an American holiday um, and you could do, focus on American originals, which are cheeses that, you know, are um, unique and original and not based on traditional cheeses from other parts of the world. If you're having Spanish, you could focus on Spanish cheese, so on and so forth. So um, that's another question that you can ask yourself when you're starting to make your selection. And then here is a slide that um, goes through some of the cheeses on your um, on your selection tonight, which some of them some of these are wrong because I did the slide before I knew the final list. Um, choosing a surface, this is actually really fun. Um, so you wanna make sure that it's food safe. Um, and so if you, you know, it's, that's kind of an obvious thing, but it probably should, some might be needed to be mentioned. Um, 
materials, they can be made out of wood, bamboo, glass, or slate. Slate's a popular thing for cheese boards. Um, it definitely can be something that you already have and not something that you need to run out and go purchase. Although I'm going to go through some places where they actually have really great boards that you can purchase. Um, but almost everybody has a wooden board that's, you know, leaning against the wall that you um, use for other things. But that's the perfect surface for building a cheese board. Um, yard sales, I've gotten some of my favorite um, cheese boards or surfaces for building cheese boards at um, yard sales. Uh, this was cheese and serving cheese was really popular, you know, in mid 20th century. So there's a lot of cool mid-century modern stuff that people just think is hideous and give away, but they're really fun. And you can start a great collection of things to serve cheese on. Um, Etsy, literally, you could fall into a rabbit hole looking for cheese boards. There are so many, um, I, I couldn't, I, started losing it, realizing how many they had. And one of my favorite places is Crate and Barrel. They really have built up a really cool selection of cheese boards and cheese tools. Also too, um, Muji, which is a Japanese company or looking for looking at places that aren't necessary, things that are, aren't necessarily meant for cheese can be great thing surfaces uh to build cheese boards vintage hammered aluminum trays these things are super fun also too lissa probably has a whole attic full of these and knives i um have a bunch of knives but if you're this is really only necessary if if you're putting out whole pieces of cheese and people need to you know pack it off and then um, serve it on their plate. Otherwise, if you're cutting the cheese in advance, this is not a necessary step. But again, Crate and Barrel has an amazing selection of cheese knives. Bosca, which is the prof a professional company that also has consumer grade cheese boards and cheese tools. Um, they are really excellent quality. And here is, uh, we're gonna go through um, some illustrations of how to cut cheese into portions. So this drawing, the, all these drawings were done by Kate Arding, who um, is, uh, she owns a shop up in Hudson, New York um, with her wife. They just expanded actually this beautiful um, cheese shop. If you ever get a chance to um, visit upstate New York, it's definitely a great destination, but these are her drawings. So this is uh, the traditional way that you cut um, this sort of uh, shape wedge of cheese. Um, this is the proper uh, correct way to cut this but I actually usually do it this way, which is just cutting it um, straight down um, and creating like a triangle. I find this uh, uniform pieces um, are a little bit easier to work with and um, the portions are actually a little bit uh, also more manageable. Firm cheeses, um, like let's say Fontina Val d'Aosta, um, this is how you um, cut a cheese. This, when you do it this way and then cut the end down here this way, this, if you cut it this way, that means that the rind is equally, dis is equally distributed. And that's like, that's one of the reasons why cheeses are cut in a certain way is for the rind to be equally distributed throughout the pieces. That's how they determine these practices. 
Um, cheeses that are shaped like this, you basically just cut them like you would a pie, although it's not a pie shaped. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. These small cheeses like this, um, if this were a telegio, which is a wheel of cheese, we would cut it in the same manner, but you would do the same thing for this like smaller, um, like robiola, um, the longa robiolas you guys might be familiar with. That's how um, the proper way that you would cut that cheese. This is just brie. You want to cut it, cut it the lengthways rather than the um, the other direction, like you would a firmer cheese. That's pretty self. -ex. So um, these bark straps cheese cheeses and tortoise style cheeses, these are meant to be opened and eaten from the top. And so. Uh, you know, if you have a group of people, a party, and you're going to probably go through the whole wheel, I would go ahead and, and cut open the whole top um, for everybody to dig into. But if you're going to buy a wheel of cheese like this for your household and you're not going to eat it in one set sitting, um, you really only want to cut a portion of the top off. Like here, they've scored it. Um, they've scored it, you know, like they've crossed through the cheese and they're only peeling up this one section here on the left. And so um, this really is, so if you're not gonna eat the whole wheel, this will keep, um, and let's say I would also keep the top that you've cut and cut away because you can place it back on the wheel and then wrap it up and store it um, to be eaten later. But this is the proper way to eat these cheeses. Um, okay. And for those looking for the uh, cheese boards, Jill shared with us in the chat, the careful peach. Uh, has some really cute ones too. So thank you for sharing. Awesome. That's great. Local, someone local. Mm -hmm. um, cookie cutters. Cookie cutters can be super fun um, to do different shapes. And, you know, like this one, they use holiday uh, cookie cutters and then it just becomes, you know, instantly the sort of holiday um, you know, your cheese, these are, can be, cookie cutters can be fun, but they also can be a little tricky. So, you know, your cheese needs to be firm enough. And um, I would imagine you would need to also um, play around with your cheese might need to be like room temperature and not straight out of the fridge when you're trying to do this. Also, you should always eat your cheese at room temperature. I should have started that from the very beginning. You need to bring your cheese out at least an hour before you're serving it. Um, cheese uh, is better, it shows more express, is more expressive when eaten at room temperature. This cheese board, I love. And it's made by Jordan Edwards, who used to live in Chicago. And now, unfortunately, well, unfortunately for Chicago, he doesn't live in Chicago anymore. He lives in California. But um, this is a cheese board he actually just made recently for his kids, um, his daughter's class at Halloween. And he used a, a cookie cutter um, to make this um, sort of crinkle cut. Um, it looks sort of like crinkle cut French fries, which is super fun. And he used string cheese to kind of make this sort of worm like thing. And he has all these vegetables with a cheese dip and it's just super fun and colorful and uh, Jordan's great. And these ghost things are actually chips or some kind of 
puffy chip or something. I was like, what is that? I thought, is that cheese? But no, it's like a chip. This is also Jordan. Um, Jordan has won the Cheesemonger Invitational, which is a competition uh, for cheesemongers that happens um, a couple of times a year. It happens here in New York City um, during the fancy food show in the summertime. I mean, we're talking about non-pandemic times, but it happens in the summertime. This year was actually in the fall. And then um, they also started doing it on, in San Francisco at the winter show, which is, which is in uh, January typically, although that's also changed. And then um, they did it one year or two in Chicago. I think they've only done it once in Chicago. So you might see it. It is an event that's open to the public and it's super fun. So if you see the Cheesemonger Invitational come to town, you must go because it is a blast and there's tons of cheese and it's um, a really fun event. But he has won the competition. And, um, and so this is another cheese board that is pretty casual. I think this uh, board is actually, he's placed everything in a pretty worn, um, a baking pan that looks like it's seen better days, but he took a cookie cutter and used the graduated cutter to create this chain, which is super cool and fun. And then he took the negative space pieces and made these little sort of leaf shapes. Um, he also cut this cheese up here in the top right and just, um, you know, inverted the rind and created this pattern here. Um, and he's looks like he's got some pickled vegetables, which you guys also have. Um, and he made so, sort of this um, crumble, these peanut brittle looking stuff. So this has got a lot of cool stuff going on on this board. Accompaniments. So accompaniments um, are things that are pretty deliberately um, selected to go with the cheeses. So choosing the right um, companion can totally elevate the cheese experience. And if you choose the not a not so great one it really doesn't do the cheese much justice but um it's not you know it's not terribly hard to figure these things out and just even just a warm crunchy baguette with an oozy brie is fantastic and sublime um honeycomb with green pear and blue cheese is a classic pairing cherry paste with um a rich sheep's milk um, from the Basque country uh, is also a classic pairing. So um, you also don't have to go further than really your pantry to um, come up with cool accompaniments for your cheeses, buckwheat honey with sheep's milk, um, marmalade, pesto, uh, big caramels, candied jalapenos. These are all um, things that you might have as snacking for snacking or graham crackers, you know, gra graham crackers with cloth bound cheddar is one of my favorite pairings. And I think I found it as by accident, but um, fried saltines with sharp cheddar and onions was actually a recipe that was in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think, uh, what is her name? The owner of Prune that was, that's been on her menu for a long time. And it, it, it was, she had it at a bar, um, growing up with her dad on Christmas Eve or something like that. There's a great story, but um, that's, you know, something that you really can be in, you can really be inventive um, 
and discover new, um, new, you know, fun accompaniments when with just what you already have. If you want to invest in a book um, about cheese uh, pairings and platings and really get into this, this is the one. If you're going to buy one book and you and never invest in another book about cheese, this is the one that I recommend. Um, it's called The Art of the Cheese Plate. And it is, it is a gorgeous book. Um, my friend Tia wrote this book and she for years um, had, had a restaurant called um, Casa Lula in, um, in Manhattan. And this thing is just full of really cool recipes and it's just a gorgeous book. Now, I thought we should talk a little bit about the difference between this on the left, this sort of style of a cheese board versus the one on the right, which is kind of what you see on Instagram a lot and is really like, you know, this is what I was talking about at the beginning, which is has really popularized people getting into cheese and charcuterie boards is this sort of style here on the right. And I have opinions about this, which you don't have to agree with me. A lot of people don't, but um, the one here on the left, this is actually uh, stuff I, this is my stuff here on the left. This is a picture I took when I had some people coming over. And the one here on the left is it's very clear that this this meat is meant to really be eaten with this cheese and this olive and this honey is meant to go with this soft ripened cheese everything makes sense and it's easy to understand um whereas this thing here on the right has figs and peanut butter cups which is kind of odd a little bit and grapes and I mean there's a lot going on here there's honey and so it's not really clear to me what things are supposed to go with what and also the style of board here on the right it looks gorgeous but when people start picking off of this thing real quick it's going to start looking like looters have like been at this board and it's not going to look it's going to look really messy after a very short amount of time so I tend to compose things like the one here on the left and um, keep things simple and so if you're interested in building a board more like the one on the right um, and you're like, I don't even know where to begin to do that. It's really just a basic design principles, which is like, you want to have a focal point and you want to have movement. So usually there's like a stripe of something going through and rhythm. So you're going to have some pieces of cheese, you know, repeated in the same way. So these are all basic design con concepts of design, and that's how you build the board. And if you're really digging this kind of, that kind of board on the right, I recommend this book. So see this, this picture here on the right is kind of the, is basically the concepts I was just talking about. The focal point is this jelly here kind of in the center and this shark, the charcuterie salami is ribboned through the center of it, creating this like movement. And these pieces of sliced cheese are, you know, rhythmic. And this is just basic um, design. And this book, That Cheese Plate Will Change Your Life is really cool 
because it's basically tells you step by step where to put stuff and how to build a board that is in this style. And she also has recommendations as far as like themes. And so, you know, maybe this board, you know, these things that she's picked out, like the peanut butter cups go with number six. And that is potentially like a perfect bite. Um, and so I, I recommend this book, this book, if you're wanting to build boards in the style, because it's really a step by step guide of how to do it. But really, it's just, you know, putting, putting things um, down. And this is the other thing I wanted to share with you guys, which is, I want to share this because I want you to really open your mind to this because this is actually how they build boards in Europe, which is they go crazy. It's like circus time over there when they are building. These are profession. This is their professional cheese competition, which is different than the American one that I mentioned earlier, but they are required to build a board and they you know, use all of these crazy props um, when they're displaying cheese. And they really think of cheese as a material um, to build sculpture. And it's really um, fun and super inventive. Like they really use all these things to get a lot of height. So you can think about that too. Like if you have a cake stand, you can put it down and then put cheese on the cake stand and then put cheese around the bottom and really um, create some visual um, interest that way. This is really, you know, this is actually not very much cheese, although this is like a practically a whole wheel of um, Blue d'Auvergne over there, but. This is also um, something from the competition. Oops. This other one, they have this tea, this tea, um, tea tray like suspended from this, this contraption, which I think is really fun. So, you know, you can really take this to new heights. This is another board of Jordans, which is just a big hunk of cloth bound shutter and a big bunch of weed. So do you guys have any questions? Because the rest of this is just kind of some information about the cheeses or we can talk about um, if you have any questions about supply chain stuff, that's really crazy right now. Okay, so I'll let you get some information about some of the cheeses. Dalmati nuts um, is one of the cheeses in your um, package. It is 90% cow's milk and 10, which is from the mainland um, in Croatia. And then 10% is uh, from one of the uh, breeds that is on Pog Island, which is uh, the breed is Pashka Ovitsa. And these sheep are, um, here's where Pog Island is on the map. This is the island. As you can see, there's very little vegetation. Um, and there is, it's the sheep, the sheep that I just mentioned, um, they are really small and they give very little milk. Um, and the, um, they don't, they don't grow very big because there's literally very little for them to eat. If you look down here at the bottom of the slide, there, there's, there's barely any grass 
and um, the cheeses. Um, and so there's also cow's milk, which they bring from the mainland because there's actually not enough there's not enough pasture for cows to even live on the island. Um, so the breed is actually a um, crossbreed from, from these two um, breeds. Here's one of the, of the actual breed. But it's amazing that they, <laughs> They live, they're really hardy because of this is rough times. Um, and so they live on shrubs and wild herbs and um, their shepherds are with them, you know, from dawn until dusk. And this particular sheep uh, or this particular um, cheese was originally um, made by a or the it, it was a collective that formed that wanted to take um, local products and promote them on the mainland and in other parts of Europe and abroad and um, it started in in 1946 and now the uh, now it's just uh, che the cheese. Um, but they have been at this for a while. And then the wheel um, has this lace pattern on the, um, on the label. And that is referencing these um, laces that the women there make. And so it references this local craft. And this is their traditional dress. That's how you can fold one of those cool hats. Um, this is a slide, this is Spain. And right here is where the Campo de Montalban you're eating is from. I don't have any more slides. So Campo, uh, uh, that cheese is a mixed milk cheese of um, cow, sheep, and goat. It's actually three different um, milks. And um, actually before Manchego was um, created or was a designated um, cheese, Manchego was this generic word used for Cheese, uh, for cheese, for basically cheese that you make at home. And manchego was just sort of this generic thing that could be made with any kind of milk. And actually in Mexico, they still use manchego to mean cheese, essentially. So if you order manchego in Mexico, there's no telling what'll come. But um, in Spain, uh, Manchego, for before it was a designated um, cheese of origin, it could be made with multiple milks and was very much like the compo, um, which is the cheese that you're given. But then once they said, we want Manchego to be specific to uh, La Mancha, it has to be made with from Manchego breed of sheep. Um, and they created all these rules around Manchego, then the cheese that you're eating couldn't be called Manchego anymore because it's made from three milks. So, um, but this cheese is made, it comes from the same region. And actually the people that make the cheese also make Manchego. So, um, and then this is down here in the bottom left, are the Canary Islands and um, Fuerza Ventura, which is where smoke and goat comes from. Um, and then the slide that was at the very beginning that had the distance, this is um, smoke and goat is where, um, is the cheese that I was referring to, 
We bring three cheeses from this area. Um, and uh, they're all really fantastic. And the people that make this cheese, um, each one of these islands actually has a different climate. Um, kind of like Hawaii, there's the different winds uh, make different microclimates and all of the different islands. Um, and uh, the Canary Islands actually have one of the most diverse um, culinary traditions in the world because they are so close to so many different, um, they take from so many different cultures. Um, here's what a wheel of smoke and goat looks like. It has this sort of basket weave on the, on, on the circumference of the wheel. And that's referencing this, um, this is made of palm, uh, palm leaves. And this is what used to be traditionally, you know, strapped around the cheeses to, to form the wheel. This is, this wheel that she's holding is of Mascherata and it's the same cheese maker. They make, he, they make this, um, the Mascherata as well. And the, these, um, the cheese makers have won many, many, many cheese awards. And actually when I started looking at the awards, they um, have won, the document was 13 pages long with all the awards they've won. And so I just, I'm not gonna have 13 pages of that. So, uh, but they are um, really wonder, they're really excellent cheese makers. And this is the um, Alfredo and his son, actually he's retired. Alfredo is retired and his two sons run um, the cheese business. This is uh, the landscape. These are the different breeds um, uh, that are found on the different islands. It's a beautiful place. It's one of their farmers. I love this woman. I never look that happy when I'm at work, seriously. Um, it looks like a dream. Uh, this is, um, so this is uh, Mercia. This is where the um, Wooly Wooly comes from, which is a fresh sheep's milk cheese. And what we wanted you guys to do is um, basically make a ball of this cheese and roll it in everything bagel. And you'll have an instant, or you, um, you could actually, if you bought this, it's a little four ounce log. If you bought the log, you could just, roll the log in everything bagel and not even handle it very much. If you didn't want it to be a, a ball, it could be just this log covered with, and you can, you could cover it with anything actually. Um, you know, you could roll it in pimenton or you could um, roll it in something, um, you know, like a spice mix that you find appealing. Also, the other two recipes that we included um, are really easy accompaniments that are, um, you know, pickles are something that you can make in just a few minutes and uh, are great to have on a cheese board because the acidity really sort of cleans your palate. So between bites of cheese, if you're um, refreshing your palate with um, the something acidic, it, um, you know, it's a palate cleanser. And then, um, and you can make pickles just with, you can use the recipe 
that we provide that they provided for you and you could pick, you can pickle anything so you guys have carrots but you can you know you can pickle um you know cucumbers or peppers or you know anything that you have um it's a great thing when you just have a little bit of vegetables left you can just make a quick pickle um to have in the in the fridge and pull them out and then the roasted grapes um, is also something really easy and is actually really easy pairing too. And those flavors in that recipe are really um, seasonal uh, and for this time of year is a great um, pairing. And that I didn't, there are other cheeses are, the other cheeses are not mine, but um, Alomar, that's a Midwest, um, Fromage Japonois, that's a guilty pleasure of mine. Bailey Hazen is from Vermont. And what else is there? I think that was it. Any questions now? No? Some people. All right. It's exactly nine o'clock. <laughs> that scared me for another eight o'clock here. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> It's nine o'clock here. <laughs> I have a quick question for Sugar Beet. With the holidays coming up, will you guys have anything um, to like help people make cheese boards that um, like we could call and you guys would pick some stuff for us? Or I feel like when I come in, there's so many, you know, different things that then I'm like, oh, I don't know what this is and how it all works. So just curious. That's a great question, Lisa. I'm going to hand that one over to you, actually. Um, there are a couple of like larger cheese trays that we do make that are a part of our catering menu. Um, if you look on our website, there's a copy there on the deli page. Um, beyond that, as far as, you know, help, help with selecting cheeses, um, I know that there are fewer people in the store maybe that are super knowledgeable, but um, I worked with Jen, so I have a cheese background. So I am definitely somebody you can ask for. Um, and then Jolie, who is our cheese uh, purchaser and handler is great too. Um, yeah, I, okay. I don't have an easy reference for you, but I can also give you some emails if you wanna shoot an email out to somebody, if you have specific questions or if you're like, give me three cheeses and, you know, this is my adventure, adventurousness level for my palate. Um, you know, we could probably put that together for you with the yeah, Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I feel like when I go in again, it's, it's like you guys have, you know, whatever's fresh and then I'm just trying to figure out, well, what, the, what it all means. So thank you. Well, and I do the wine buying too. So I'm sometimes in that aisle. And so I try to, uh, you know, address people, but if you don't see somebody, you can always ask and hopefully one of us is around or like I said, you can um, shoot us an email and we can get you hooked up. Perfect. Yeah, I've been spoiled with, um, I did Jen's, you know, the last cheese one she did. So when I just come and pick up cheese from you guys, I'm like, how do I make this happen more often? <laughs> um, we do have a question, Jen. Um, we were wondering about, you mentioned the supply chain and could you talk a little bit about how it's being impacted? Yeah, it's really, um, it's really every producer that we work with, as almost everyone has an issue with something. So like maybe this one is having trouble getting the boxes that they're packing the, the, the cheese into. Uh, maybe this person is having trouble finding the cherries that we make chocolate covered cherries. 
Um, the uh, milk, ha milk has been an ongoing issue for a long time, especially sheep and goat's milk. Um, like, like here in America, people, you know, kids aren't uh, aspiring to be um, shepherds anymore. They're aspiring to be uh, uh, tech engineers. And so there's less and less people wanting to do um, the shepherding. And so milk um, is getting more and more scarce and that um, not only drives up the price, but even just getting enough milk sometimes to make the cheese um, is difficult. And so just the material, the raw materials themselves is a, is a big challenge. And then um, the, uh, the huge challenge, which is, um, is just along the lines that nobody has ever experienced, it's never happened before, is there is a lack, there's a backlog, the ports are just packed and there's not enough containers or the containers are in, a, in the wrong spot. And so, you know, we're, so for example, as far as pricing is concerned, normally it costs us $3,000 to ship a container. And now we're paying $10,000 per container. And that's just freight. <laughs> so um, it's, we're paying a premium because there's such a backlog of containers too that if the vessel is leaving and there's only so much room, they're gonna, they're, they'll leave a container behind, right? They'll just leave stuff behind. And if you're paying a higher price, you're more likely to get on the vessel. Also, the routes are crazy. Like, um, <laughs> Like we have a delay in Parmigiano uh, and I was like, where's the vessel? And the last, the vessel, like two days ago, it was in the Azores. And it's like, I don't even like, they, the routes, they can be delayed in a particular place. There was a container that we a uh, ship. We had containers on a ship where I guess the whole crew had, COVID. So they weren't letting any, they weren't letting the vessel dock. And that, so that was 14 days, right? They couldn't, everybody was quarantined for 14 days. So that's 14 days of perishable products sitting on the water. Um, so it's just been really, really difficult. Um, even worse than during the height of the pandemic, getting stuff is more difficult and, and so, and super costly. So like if it's costing $10,000, like we sell, we sell this product called Kiko's, which is basically like a corn nut and they're, they're corn nuts, right? They don't weigh anything, but they take up space. And it's like, we sell so much of this stuff. And it's like, we could fill a container of this shit and sell it. But it's like, I don't want, we don't want to pay 10 grand for a container of Kiko's. You know what I mean? It's crazy. So it's, it's like juggling um, so many different uh, factors and, um, at the same time, at the same time, like prices um, during the pandemic too, people's purchasing habits changed. So people were like, you know, it was a scary time. And so a lot of people were not buying fresh and uh, soft cheese and they were only buying hard cheeses that they could you know, store and save for, you know, what they thought like, oh, I can have this Parmigiano in my fridge for a month or whatever. So sales of aged cheeses went way up and soft and fresh cheeses went way down. And so the demand, so all of the supply 
of harder age cheeses and even longer age Manchego was just went through the roof. And so now there's a shortage of like Manchego because uh, now we're just waiting for cheese to literally age. It's like watching paint dry or something, you know, it's like, okay, I can give you three month Manchego, but I can't give you one year Manchego. So the older the cheese is, the less of it there is. And especially like uh, Pecorino Romano, there's such a shortage of it right now. Like we sell uh, Pecorino Romano that's actually from Rome and it's like a premium, it's a pr premium cheese. And in Sardinia, the cheese that comes from Sardinia is less expensive and um, the milk that comes from the milk there is cheaper and the labor is cheaper there. So the cheese is less expensive and they, they make cheese in slightly a different way. Our cheese usually costs a lot, uh, costs more. And now the cheese in Sardinia has gone up so much in price that people who normally wouldn't buy our cheese are buying the cheese because there's just, there's so little um, cheese left. So that's also a problem. Um, but the containers are the biggest thing. I mean, they started, I don't know if you read, but Biden, they started paying an incentive for people to move get the containers moving um, and that, uh, I mean, we were actually doing okay up until about two weeks ago. And then it's just gotten really bad because our sales are, we don't have enough cheese. Like, like today I was looking just at one PO and like, the original PO had 1600 cases on it and we only were able to ship like 900. Like we were short 600 and something cases of whatever. Um, it's fascinating though, the pro this problem, how it happened and but it's gonna go on for a while more. And then the prices will adjust. So actually the freight costs have gone up so much. So right now the exchange rate is actually in our favor. So we were able to lower prices because of the exchange, but then the freight costs outweighed the, the exchange. So we still actually had to raise prices. So our prices are going up in January to all of our customers. We're hoping we, we try everything possible to not raise prices in the fourth quarter for our customers. So we almost always year after year take a financial hit for that because of that, because we just, it's just bad <laughs> to do it at that time of year. Um, so you will see um, some price increases on cheeses in the future. Around from us, like anywhere from three to 5%, but more also Marcona almonds. There's a huge, huge, huge shortage of Marcona almonds. And the prices for Marconas are way, way, way up. Any other questions? Cool. Well, I hope you guys eat some cheese for ho the holidays. If you can find it, ha, 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 ha. Mm -hmm. No, there's plenty of cheese. I always, when people are like, I can't believe you don't have this. I'm like, there's, it's sell them something else. Like there's always something else to try. Um, so if they're, if you're out of, if they're out of your favorite thing, then try something new. It'll be something special, I'm sure. 
All right. Are we going to say good night now? <laughs> yeah, thank you for joining us, everybody. Yeah, it was great to see some faces. Oh, Eric finally turned his camera on. Hi. I was, I was walking for a little bit. I didn't want to disturb you. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> Thanks so much, Joan. It's nice to see you and Scott and it's great Always to, good see, to see, you. see you, Jen. Yeah, it's great to see you. Oh, look, there's a little person. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. Good night. Have good a night. good night, everyone.